thank you for being here this morning and welcome to Grace Bible Chapel. Another beautiful day that the Lord has created for us and this is the day we come together corporately to worship our God, our Savior, our Creator corporately and praise His name and learn more about Him. And in that to that end this morning, I continue my, my series. Actually, I'm continuing two series this morning. I've got one series that has to do with doctrine, and we've been looking at the doctrine of sin as we've, as we've taken a look at Genesis chapter 3. And I'm also, uh, I've got another series going where I just pick almost random uh, passages out of Scripture as I read through the entire Scripture in a year. And that is uh, the McShane method, and it goes through the New Testament twice. And recently, uh, about a month ago, um, finished the New Testament for the first time. And of course, I was reading through the book of Revelation, which is where we're going to be this morning. And uh, going to tie this in with a subject that we've been dealing with, and that is sin. And I, I think this will be the last time I talk about that particular subject. Uh, as far as a doctrinal study of it. And this is sin in the church. This is sort of the last, the last uh, sort of uh, facet of sin, if you will, that I want to I deal with. Uh, like I said, we'll be looking at Revelation this morning. It's going to be from chapter 2, and it's going to be verses 12 through 17. And this is in, of course, that wonderful section of the letters straight from our Lord's mouth, Jesus Christ, to churches, various churches in Asia Minor, what we call today Turkey. And uh, the church we're going to be looking at this morning is Pergamum, and we'll be reading Christ's message to that particular church. So Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, and to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold firmly to my name, and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So you too have some who in the same way hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows except the one who receives it. Let's pray together and ask the Lord's blessing on the teaching this morning and on me. Father, we thank you once again for drawing us together, pulling us through another week, Father, guarding us from all the corruption and death of the world, Father. Father, just keeping us in your name, as you have promised to do, Father. We thank you that you have given us the grace to persevere to another Lord's day. In that spirit, Father, we come before you to worship you, to praise you, to honor you, to learn more about you, and yes, also to be warned by you, Father. Father, let us heed the warnings of the scriptures. Let us take them to heart, even as a church, even as believers and followers of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So this is a fairly familiar, I think, passage of scripture, these, these letters to the churches of Asia Minor. You remember this opens up the book of Revelation, which is largely a book of prophecy, right? The Apocalypse of, 
of, of John, if you will, the revelation to John of, of what's going to occur and how it's going to occur in the latter days. And of all, I, there, there was a time I thought it was a little strange the way the book of Revelation begins with these letters. It seems, it seems like it should be a, a, a separate book maybe, right? You got these letters to the church and then, which of course occurs in a vision, occurs in a vision just like the rest of the Revelation, but the rest of the Revelation has to do with future events. And I, I thought that once that, you know, maybe the, the sages made a mistake and maybe could have put it in a different book. But the more I think about it, the more it makes sense. And I think we'll see how those two events, the, the, the message of Christ contemporaneously to the Christians of that time and by extension us, and then the teachings about the future coming of Jesus Christ and his judgment. Now, I could have chosen any one of the churches to talk about because they're all fascinating, um, but this one particularly struck my, my fascination, um, not because I see something about it in Grace Bible Chapel. It's not, that's not why I chose it. And, Sometimes if you pick, you know, if you cherry pick one of these churches out of it, there's a tendency for people listening to it to say, well, he must be, he must be talking about us. That's, that's not why I chose it, although I do say that I think it's got a particular message for the church, the true church of Jesus Christ in America. So I think that message in a very broad sense could be separation from the world, separation from the world. This is a, of course, a broad topic in scripture, but I think it's important for us to remember that the commandment to be separate has always been the commandment of God. If you want to keep your finger there in Revelation chapter 2 and flip back, and we're going to just sort of just cruise through Leviticus 18 and 19. Go back to Leviticus chapter 18, and of course, this particular uh, portion of scripture has to do with the instructions of the Lord to, to the Israelites through Moses about how are they to conduct themselves as a nation in a wide variety of, of spheres, uh, the religious sphere, the social sphere, uh, the governmental sphere, how the society is to be structured, uh, and also morality, the morality of these people. Now, as you know, they came out of Egypt where they had been for generations you know, and had certainly picked up a lot of the, the mores and the customs of the Egyptian people. I think we can expect that. We can assume that. Um, this would have been pre-recorded written scripture, so they didn't necessarily have a lot to guide them. This would have been before the, the priesthood, um, when they were in Egypt, that is. So... Uh, it's, I think, pretty safe to assume, and perhaps we don't think about this a lot, but, but their, their morality probably matched pretty closely or aligned pretty closely with whatever the customs were in the pagan world that they inhabited. And if we look at Leviticus chapter 18, we begin to see the Lord pulling them out of that. And let's just take a look at what he says. First of all, in verse number one, he says, then the Lord spoke to Moses. This is a very, very common and constant refrain in this particular book and in, in Numbers as well, that uh, this was coming directly th from the Lord, the mouth of the Lord, just like the letters in Revelation were coming directly from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself to Moses. It says in verse 2, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. Okay? You may have had other gods, you may have worshipped other gods, you may have recognized other gods, but now I am the Lord your God. I am taking possession of you. Verse 3 says, You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived. Okay? Nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in your statutes. So they're coming out of a pagan land, and they're going into a pagan land. And God says, whatever they're doing there, I don't want you doing the same things. Okay? And I think they were probably well aware of what was going on, and maybe even practicing the same things. Instead, in verse 4, he says, you are to 
you are to perform my judgments. Again, a, p- a possessive pronoun, my judgments, and keep my statutes to live in accord with them. I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and my judgments. And then in verse 6, we get this, this sort of uh, litany, if you will, of, of you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. So these are lists of things that were common in the pagan world at the time. And if you took the time to read through all these, you'll see a word pop out again and again. Verse 7, nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. That is the nakedness, that is the nakedness of your, your mother. And then again, you shall not uncover, in verse 8, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife, and so on and so forth. Verse 10, the nakedness of your son's daughter, the nakedness of your father's wife's daughter. Verse 11, so all of this about nakedness. Now, why does God go on and on about nakedness? Well, and we have archaeological and historical uh, records to back this up. Nakedness was a very common vice in the pagan world in Egypt. And not just because it was hot. It was because, and we tend to think of this in in sort of, you know, rivulous ways now and perhaps are humorous, but it was a very orgiistic pagan culture. Sexual immorality is rampant, and the same was true in the land they were going to. They were going to the land of Canaan, which may have even been worse in terms of sexual immorality and and moors and things of that sort. So that, you know, if you go all the way down through verse 18, it's all about nakedness, not uncovering the naked. And, 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 you know, I'll admit that it's probably some of that is a euphemism for... uh, sexual acts itself, but it's really just talking about this, this, uh, this atmosphere of uh, promiscuity and libertinism in regards to dress, and of course, we can see that today, right? Um, women, by and large, young women in the world, unbelievers, the unredeemed world, uh, do not dress modestly, by and large, today. And so we can see a bit of our own, our own situation there. Verse 19 says, also you shall not approach a woman. I'm sorry, that's, that's the same thing. If we go down to verse 24, it says, do not defile yourselves by any of these things. For by all these things, the, nation, the nations which I am driving you out of have become defiled. So God's saying, these nations that you're coming out of, they're all defiled by them. They're all corrupted by them. I don't want that for you. Verse 30 says, so you are to keep your commitments to who? To me. Okay, again, God's saying, you belong to me now. I do not want you acting. I do not want you emulating. I don't want you participating in the things of the world. Not to practice any of the abominable customs which you have been practiced before you, so that you do not what defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. The next chapter, verse nine, uh, chapter nineteen, verse two says, "Speak to all the congregation again, speaking to Moses, the Lord here. Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Okay, holy." has a very big aspect of it of being set apart, separated, different, if you will, above, beyond, uh, particularly in areas of morality and righteousness. And it goes on and it gives you the uh, more, do not, and in verse 4 it says, do not turn to idols. So now we're seeing a shift from God saying to them, uh, talking to them about morality, particularly sexual morality, and also, I should mention in the previous chapter, there's all kinds of things about, about what we might even call today social justice and how we're supposed to be treating each other within the, the activities of a common economy and, and that sort of thing. Uh, not socialism, but um, it says, do not turn to idols. So now we're talking about religious activity. Now we're talking about worship. So you had this sort of personal morality, and now it's about worship. I don't want you worshiping like they worship. Not only is your activity, your decorum, your living supposed to be different, but your worship is 
it's supposed to be different. Verse 5 says, now when you sacrifice a peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten on the same day you offer it and on the next day, but what remains until the third day shall be burned with fire. So there's all these prescriptions about how they're supposed to offer a sacrifice, and it's different than the way the pagan world did sometimes the very same thing, animal sacrifice, sometimes even human sacrifice. But God is, God is separating uh, the activity of Israel from the activity of the pagan world. So this is all about having them be separate, having them be act differently, look differently, um, worship differently than the rest of the world. Uh, if you look down, I was talking about some social issues. In verse 13, it says, you shall not oppress your neighbor nor rob him, um, which was that kind of corruption was rampant in the pagan world. Unfortunately, it would become rampant in Israel as well. The wages of a hired worker are not to remain with you all night until morning. You pay them that same, that same day. Those sorts of things that were very atypical of the way people conducted business in the world. God just did not want them to look anything like them. Uh, verse 26 says, You shall not eat any meat with blood. You shall not proc practice divination or soothsaying. You shall not round off the hairline of your heads nor trim the edges of your beard. These were customs. These were religious customs of some of the priesthood of the pagan nations. You shall not make any cuts in your body. Um, uh, for the dead, and of course we see this in Islam today where they kind of slash themselves as atonement, nor make any tattoo marks on yourselves, I am the Lord. Again, separation is the key word. Now, what I want you to realize when going through this is this idea of separation, which we know we read about in the New Testament. This has always, always been God's standard for his people. That's never changed. God has always called his people, careful how I phrase this, I was going to say out of the world. He's called them out of the world spiritually. He's called them out of the world behaviorally. He's called them out of the world religiously, if you want to use that word. Now, we remain in the world as salt and light in the world, but our lives, our devotions, our affections, our behavior is all separated and out of the world. All right, so let's flip back. Let's flip back to Revelation. Because I think this is exactly what Christ is dealing with in this particular church at Pergamum. Now, John, who was receiving this revelation, would have been very familiar with these churches. He was the pastor at Ephesus, of course, which was kind of the mother church of all these other churches you know, in Asia Minor. Uh, Paul establishes the church at Ephesus, and from there, we know from reading in the book of Acts that that, that church spreads throughout uh, and does church plants throughout Asia Minor. Okay? Um, the apostle John, at the, at the moment that he receives this revelation, of course, he's been arrested. Um, in fact, if you go back to chapter 1 of Revelation, just flip back to verse 9, he tells you why he's been arrested. It says he was uh, arrested... Um, uh, Verse 9 says, uh, John, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos. That's where he was sent. It was a prison colony breaking up rocks. Why? Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he was there for two reasons. Because of his commitment to the word of God and because of his commitment and affection for Jesus Christ. That's why he was on this island, okay? Now, those two things, the commitment to those two things is what set the churches in Asia Minor in conflict with their environment, their cities, was commitment to the word of God and commitment to Jesus Christ, the testimony of Jesus Christ that he was the son of God, that he was God, those two things. So he can identify with what's going on in Asia Minor. And if you read through the letters, you'll see persecution after persecution after persecution being mentioned and Christ acknowledging that persecution and oftentimes commending them.
for standing up to the person. In fact, there's two churches out of those, that uh, Philadelphia and Smyrna, that uh, receive really no condemnation at all. Let's take a look at these churches, by the way. Let's go to Revel back to Revelation chapter 2. Let's go to verse 1. And I want to take a look particularly right now at just how the individual letters, these individual letters, how they begin, how Christ addresses himself to these churches. To Ephesus, he says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, right? This is a picture of Jesus Christ, excuse me, right there as John is seeing him. John sees him among the lampstands with the seven stars. So this is a, uh, this is, uh, to Ephesus, this, this is kind of his calling card. I am Jesus Christ. Just as John saw him, he can tell you, I am Jesus Christ. It's, it's meant to be encouraging. It's meant to be um, validating. If we look at Smyrna, uh, in verse 8, the letter to Smyrna begins, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this. Okay, Smyrna was receiving intense, intense persecution to death. So in an encouragement, Christ introduces himself as someone who is dead but has come to life. So he's offering them encouragement. Hey, there's resurrection here, okay? I know you're experiencing death, but I was dead and I was raised again. Thyatira, the church of Thyatira, Revelation 2.18 says, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. This is a, this is a look at power and strength, okay? Thyatira was experiencing weakness through the heaviness of the persecution. They were feeling weak. So Christ is saying, I'm strong. I see everything. I have eyes like fire and my feet are like bronze. I'm stronger. Stronger is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If we look at Sardis in Revelation 3.1, the way he introduces himself. Uh, there, now we're in chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who, ha who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. This is about, I'm not going to go into an explanation of what the, the seven spirits of God are, but this is about spiritual completeness. This is about provision for everything they needed, and they understood it as much. Philadelphia, Revelation 3, 7, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this. Again, the power and the majesty of Jesus Christ holding the key of David. He opens something and no one will shut it. The gates of hell will not prevail against this church. That's what he's saying. Laodicea, Revelation 3.14, says to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The amen, he's faithful and true. All of this was meant to be very encouraging. Now, except for the two churches I mentioned, he would go on to, to Christ in his, in his brief letters, would go on to be very scathing in his denunciation of some of their failings. But he opens up in a very positive way reassuring way. These are, these are letters to his people, okay? These aren't to the cities of Smyrna. These aren't to the cities of Laodicea. These are to his children in those cities that happen to live in those cities. So he's being a good shepherd. He's, he's opening up with encouragement and positivity, except when you get to Pergamum which is the third church. It's in, back in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. This is an exception here, and it's one of the reasons why I find this particular letter fascinating. It begins in verse 12, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write this, The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. Let me tell you what the sharp two-edged sword is. 
if we were to go, and you don't have to go there, but if we were to go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, we get an image to John, receives an image of Jesus Christ coming to earth in a vision at the end of this tribulation period. And verse 15 says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. This is speaking of the return of Christ, and he's called faithful and true, the word of God. He's faithful and true, the word of God. The sword coming out of his mouth is not really speaking about scriptures. The sword that comes out of his mouth is so that he might strike down the nations. That's the purpose of the sword that's coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, not, it's not the gospel looking to save. It's not, it's not looking to comfort. It's Jesus Christ has a sword coming from his mouth, and with it, whoosh, he's going to lay flat all of his enemies in one fell stroke. It's a sword. It's a weapon. That's what the sword is. It is absolutely a weapon. It's a weapon in every regard, spiritually, physically. So we get a sense of something with Pergamum that I think is different. And I'm not going to read all the letters. That is different from the other churches. In the other churches, you get the sense of encouragement because Christ will go on to explain that you know they're, they're in constant danger from the society around them in terms of persecution. Well, I believe that was true also of Pergamum. But I think the real danger that Christ is warning them is not from the world, but from himself. The real danger to the church of Pergamum is Jesus Christ himself. Okay. Let's take a look at some facets of this particular level, uh, letter. Again, this is contained in Revelation 2, verses 12 through 17. And I'll reread the beginning portion. And it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write this, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword, the one who has this weapon, he's got this, this weapon of destruction and judgment, and here's what he has to say. Okay? I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. I know where you are. Now, some might find in here a little bit of encouragement. I don't. I think this is just a statement of fact from Jesus Christ. Some might say, well, he's kind of saying, yeah, I know where you live, and it's tough. It's the throne of Satan. So, you know, I understand. It's hard not to get mixed up into that stuff. I don't, I don't see any of that going on. Let's talk about where Pergamum actually was. And again, it was in Asia Minor. Probably the most significant thing about Pergamum, the, which you... And again, it's, it's ruins now, but what you read about again and again uh, from ancient writings is they had this magnificent library, uh, probably second only to the library at Alexandria. And it was said to have 200,000 volumes. These would be, by the way, handwritten volumes. There's no printing press. That's pretty impressive, 200,000 volumes of handwritten text. Okay. So because of this massive library, it was considered an important center for culture and learning. Okay. This would have been like Harvard, you know. This would have been where the, the elite went to go learn. And the city saw itself as a defender of Greek culture. Again, in Asia Minor, you're up against these sort of eastern powers in Persia. And so they saw themselves as sort of a, a, uh, a, a bulwark of uh, Greek culture, okay? And they, they saw themselves as defenders. There was also a massive altar to Zeus there, largest altar to Zeus in the world. And it was commemorating the victory of the, the Pergamians over invading Gauls. And it was an important center of worship for Zeus. Okay, so you have, you have this intellectual, cultural um, landmark in the library, and now you have this you have this uh, religious landmark, this religious pagan uh, place of importance. Um, they also, uh, by the way, that, that particular uh, uh, temple to Zeus, uh, it was huge. Um, it had a huge courtyard, about 120 by 112 feet, an altar, 
and the altar was 18 feet high, um, and it ran for about 446 feet around. Um, it was one of the, really one of the great, great works of art in the Greek world. But what is, what does Christ talk about when he talks about this temple? He calls it the throne of Satan. All false gods are Satan. All false gods are fronts for Satan. Okay. Christ does not um, uh, sugarcoat that issue. But overshadowing all these great structures, great in the minds of the pagan world, was a massive edifice devoted to the cult of emperor worship. This is where emperor worship in the Roman world, outside of Rome itself, was really centered. Okay? They kind of started it. They were kind of the, the missionaries for the cult of the emperor. Okay? And they apparently built the first temple devoted to emperor uh, worship in Asia in 29 BC in honor of Emperor Augustus, and it was quite a place. So you have this, you have this center of, of Greek culture and the worship of Zeus. You have this center of emperor worship from the Roman world. You have this center of humanistic learning from the Greek world in the library. Uh, this was not a friendly place for Christians. It was not a friendly place for the Christian message, as we'll see when we read on in this letter about what happened to one of them. Okay? The city was full of idolatry. Um, every day, every day of the year, the people were, were required, um, on one, I'm sorry, on one day of the year, every year, the people were required to sacrifice, to offer a sacrifice to the emperor, and if they didn't, they would die. So if you're a Christian, and you said Jesus is Lord, and you refused to offer a sacrifice to the emperor, the penalty was death, okay? We don't know exactly how often that was enforced, but that was the law, okay? So that you lived with that over your head. And it was, as we'll, like I said, as we'll read it, it was enforced at least once. So it may have cost you your life to be a Christian. Okay, so the, they, were not, they were not exalted in some way above tribulation like the other churches. I mean, uh, just like the other churches, they were experiencing tribulation and persecution. But Christ doesn't really mention that in his letter other than to say, I know where you are. I know the things that go on around you, okay? And I don't think he means that in a comforting way, like I'm, I'm willing to let this slide. I think he means that don't think that I don't know what's going on there, okay? So in this city, we have no separation between religious life, between politics and social life. It was all blended together, so it was very, very stressful on Christians. Okay? There wasn't really a facet of life that they could detach from without detaching from the society itself. It was all, it was all wound up together. And I, I can kind of identify with that. I don't know if you can too, but what I find is increasingly in my, my, my life, my Christian life, which is my life, uh, it's becoming harder and harder to find things to enjoy in the world, not, not because I'm so jaded necessarily, but because all the institutions that I once admired that I once enjoyed. I'll just give you a trivial example. I, for my whole life, I've loved baseball, but if you notice what's happening in American sport and where it's going with, with different political things and how it's aligning itself with various Marxist movements, I mean, it's, you know, I'm getting to the point where I'm just kind of like, do, you know, is it even worth it to enjoy that? And like all of these institutions that we once, as Christians, were able to sort of uh, enjoy in the world, well, the forces of Satan, the throne of Satan, has invaded them, um, ransacked them, hollowed them out, and is wearing their, their, their hides as a 
as a suit, you know? It's like pretending to be them, you know? They're dead, he's just wearing their hides. Okay, and so it's very hard. I think that must have been how they, somewhat how they felt in Pergamum is, is all of these things they once enjoyed, there was nothing left to enjoy that was not contrary to what they were supposed to be as a Christian. Let's take a look back at um, okay, back to uh, where we were in chapter two. Now, verse fourteen. So he says, um, well, back up to uh, verse thirteen, where he says, "I know where you dwell." He says, uh, he talks about this man named Antipas, my witness. He says, and and didn't uh, he talks about the. You hold firmly to my name. So in the midst of all this, and I want, you, I want you to notice, he starts talking about you and them. He says, and you hold firmly to my name and did not deny my faith. There's that personal pronoun that we saw back in Leviticus. My faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness. So we don't know a lot about Antipas. Uh, church tradition tells us that he was boiled alive or cooked alive in a brass bowl you know, whatever that whatever that looked like I'm sure it was not a pleasant death and it, it likely was because he refused this emperor worship so he may have been an elder in the church refused this to offer sacrifice to the emperor and probably they sought to make an example of him but Christ is saying you held, you held fast even even in the days of Antipas, when you saw this going on, he's called a my witness, my faithful one. That's why I believe he was an elder. Who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Okay? There's that reiteration that this is, a, this is the hometown of Satan. Okay? But verse 14 jumps right into it. It says, but I have a few things against you. Take, take note of that personal pronoun. I have a few things against you because... You have some, so there's this you, and there's this some there, who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think we all know who Balaam was, but I'm just going to just sort of skim, skim through it here. Balaam, of course, he's that Old Testament character. Um, he was a renowned magician, sorcerer um, from Mesopotamia. Um, and he was somehow, he was aware of the God of Israel. And he received true revelation from the God. Even though he was pagan, he received true revelation from the God of Israel. And, uh, and, he, and he, like maybe a lot of people, were aware that God, what God had done in delivering Israel from the Egyptians and the Exodus. Um, but he aligns himself with this king, Balak, to, who wants to destroy the Israelites. He, he um, rightly assesses his coming to, to take his land. And uh, he's, you know, he wants to come up with a plan or seek at least the favor of God initially to defeat and to curse Israel in their endeavors. Um, and so he made that, he made alliance with uh, Balak for money, okay? He wanted money. Um, but what he didn't do was he didn't give Balak initially what he wanted. He couldn't curse Israel because he said, doesn't even matter whether I curse them or not because God's for them. And he repeats this again and again to Balak. But, and we see this in Numbers 22 to 24, um, the story continues that three times Balaam tries to curse Israel. He can't do it. He can't succeed. So he develops another strategy. He says, if I can't curse them, I'll corrupt them. And so he got a bunch of Moab's women, Balak's women to seduce Jewish men into intermarriage. And thus he pulled those men into an idolatrous, immoral life in Moab. He pulled them into paganism. Okay. And they went back into eating things, sacrificed to idols, and back into committing idolatry, and just the very things they had seen in Egypt. Right? And 
such unions with these pagan women brought the men of Israel into a blasphemous union with Satan. So they de-separated themselves. They reunified themselves with what they had been pulled out of. Okay? The curses didn't work. The corruption did. Okay? Eventually, God intervenes and manages to destroy those who had been corrupted and save a remnant of Israel, as he always does. So what's the point that Christ is making? Bring up this character, Balaam. It says, uh, you've got some people there, and they're acting just like Balaam. They're seducing you back into the very culture that you've been delivered from. They're pulling you back in. God has called you to be separate, and they are pulling you back in. So you've got these two groups of people, the yous and the thems, or the yous and the sums. I don't know which was the majority or the minority, and it doesn't really matter. You've got this faithful you who this, who this letter is being written to, written, uh, being, being passed along to John to be heard by, and then you've got some people in this church, them, who are still involved in the wickedness of their city, this throne of Satan, and attempting to pull, or simply by their um, uh, passive influence, pulling people back into this wickedness, okay? Uh, what did it look like, practically speaking? Um, they probably began uh, attending pagan feasts again with all the debauchery associated with that. Immorality, incest, homosexuality, bestiality, that was all coming back into the church because of this them, okay? And apparently the church had not taken any action to confront it, none, okay? So Christ is saying to them, I am gonna come with a sword coming out of my mouth. <laughs> and what, does that, what is the purpose of that sword as we saw in Revelation 19? To destroy, this is a warning, okay? Let's go back. Now let's take a look at verse 15, Revelation 2, verse 15. Talks about these uh, Nicolaitans and what was their issue? Well, probably the best way to describe it is they, they were kind of doing the same thing that the people that uh, were acting like Balaam were doing, except probably from another side. They were doing it not from the, the religious side, necessarily, but from the cultural side, the Greek side. So all of these practices and thoughts and philosophies that are contrary to Jesus Christ and his church were seeping back in through these people. But, you know, it's, it's really the same thing. It's just corruption. It's just melding back into the society from which you've been pulled. Um, to the two church fathers, Two of the church fathers, Arrhenius and Clement of Alexandria, describe these people, Nicolaitans, as this. They live lives of unrestrained indulgence, abandoning themselves to pleasure like goats, leading a life of self-indulgence. Like goats. What are goats, what are goats known for? They will eat anything. These people will consume anything. Okay? It doesn't matter. If it's out there in their society, they're going to eat it, all right? How true does that ring in our society now? So you had these two groups of people identified by Christ corrupting the church. Okay, verse 16 says, Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will wage war against them, so you repent, or else I will wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. So what is the threat here? The threat is repent. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the yous here. He's talking to the believers here. Well, what do they need to repent of? They're not part of this crowd that's doing all these things. What they need to repent of is the fact that they tolerate this, that they let it go on. And he's saying, if you keep letting it go on, if you don't exercise this, from your midst, I'm going to come and wage war against them, and guess what? You're going to be collateral damage. 
you're going to get blown up right along with them. So you better get them out. Verse 17. Um, of course, we could talk about what repent means, but it, it, and I, I do have to speed up here, but it means to turn away and go the other way. Stop, stop tolerating this worldly compromise. Stop to tolerating this unequal yokeness with these people. Just as we saw back when Israel came back from captivity, Ezra and Nehemiah, this yokeness, this, this being yoked with pagan women, they had to be unyoked, forcibly unyoked. And that's what he's saying. You need to do that. Okay? To end the, the letter, verse 17 says, The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right? It's basically saying, if you have an ear, if you have an ear, who gives you the ear to listen to what God says? God himself, the Holy Spirit. So if you're in me and you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, listen. To the one who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows except the one who receives it. So who are the ones who overcome? Those are the ones who overcome by virtue of true faith. Uh, believers, the overcomers, as we see throughout the New Testament, um, these are the ones who overcome the influence of these people that are pulling them back in to the world. How do they overcome them? They expel them. They expel them. And what is the promise? It says to him, I will give some of the hidden manna. In other words, I will give uh, this nourishment. And of course, we know that, ha that manna was this honey bread that the Lord put in the wilderness during the wandering. Um, it, is a it is supernatural sustenance, supernatural food. In other words, I'm going to give you I'm going to replace these pleasures of the world. I'm going to replace these things that are seducing you and corrupting you back into the world. I'm going to replace them with my pleasures, the pleasures found in me. And of course, we know that that finds its culmination in Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life. Um, also, it says, I will give you a white stone. All right, I think the best understanding of this comes from the ancient world where victors were given a white stone, like a trophy. Uh, and their names were put on it. And just like it says, Christ is going to put a new name on it for you. Why a new name? Because in him, we are new creation. Christ is going to give us a new name that the world hasn't given us. Remember, we're separated from the world now. All right, so I need to wrap up. But the point is this. And circling back to what I've been teaching about or what we've been talking about in regards to sin. It's not even enough for Christians to separate themselves from sin personally. You've got to expel it from your midst. You have to, you have to turn it away. You have to oust it from your very presence. And to me, that's that's a really, really sobering thought. Um, otherwise, the consequence is Christ is going to come and he's going to destroy you with the sword of his mouth. Christ does not accept unrighteousness, immorality, rampant paganism, whatever you want to call it, in his church. He would just as soon destroy it. I'm talking about local churches now, not the entire church, because we know that that won't happen. So just a sobering reminder of what's online, on, on the line as far as sin is, even in the midst of redeemed people. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us these warnings from your word. Father, we thank you that we have these letters to these churches to to make us think about what your standards are, what Jesus Christ expects from his bride. And it is a high, high bar, Father, that we can only meet. 
with your word, with your help, and with your grace. And we ask for all of that in Christ's name. Amen.